Good afternoon and welcome to the American College of Healthcare Executives Central Illinois Chapter Webinar, Healthcare Executive Career Management in a Web 2.0 Era. ACHE has authorized 1.5 hours of Category 2 education credit for this presentation. After the webinar, you will be directed to a short survey, which the Education Committee hopes you will take the time to fill out. If any IT problems arise, please visit anymeeting.com slash support for further assistance. As we begin the presentation, can you please mute your telephone lines until the question and answer portion of the event. On the left-hand side of the webinar platform screen is a text box to write a question to the presenter that will be answered at the end of the presentation. We are proud to host and welcome B.E. Smith providers of this afternoon's excellent webinar on healthcare executive career management and a Web 2.0 error. B.E. Smith, our valued partner, is a full-service leadership solution firm for healthcare providers. Their comprehensive services include interim leadership, permanent executive placement, and consulting solutions. Modern Healthcare has ranked B.E. Smith as the number one executive search firm in healthcare. I would like to introduce Cheryl Burback. Cheryl Burback is a partner at Hovey Williams and her practice focuses on trademark, copyright, social media, and related internet issues. Her business counseling practice has included assisting a wide range of intellectual property, internet, marketing, and newly formed companies with matters as diverse as prosecuting trademark and copyright applications, managing a large trademark portfolio, creating company-wide intellectual property identification and protection programs, creating comprehensive employee trademark prote protection programs and licensing. Cody Birch, Associate Vice President, Talent Strategies, has been responsible for sourcing and marketing initiatives at B. Smith for more than six years. During that time, he has been on the cutting edge of leveraging social media to attract the top leaders for executive openings across the country. Jamie Oaks, Regional Vice President, brings over 20 years of healthcare experience to his role, specializing in information technology, operational efficiencies, revenue enhancements, and strategic planning. He has partnered with hospitals, GPOs, managed care organizations, and large healthcare vendors in the central region and across the country. These clients have realized significant benefit through Jamie's strategic and financial direction. Christine Reese, Vice President of Market Strategy for BE Smith, is a fellow healthcare executive and former cl clinician who has served in numerous leadership roles for several Fortune 500 companies, including HCA, Sprint, and Cerner. Christine Ricci is best known for her extensive corporate strategy, marketing, and operational experience, and her ability to deliver superior customer service, resulting in increased revenue and market share growth. Now I will pass the floor over to Jamie Oaks, who will begin the presentation. Thank you, Greg. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you to all of you that uh, have joined and are joining uh, the conference call today. So we're going to get into, uh, we'll, we'll get started here uh, fairly quick with Christine. We're going to get into social media trends, job market trends, and legal trends. But So let's start with you, Christine. Can you tell us what social media trends you're seeing in general uh, as well as within healthcare? You bet, and good afternoon, everybody. Typically, when I'm working with healthcare executives, there's several questions that I will get asked. I'll get asked if social media is overhyped or is it a reality. I'll get asked if LinkedIn is a place where, where they should be. Is Facebook a waste of time? Is Twitter on its way out? And, and for my CFO friends, I'll always get asked the question, can I generate a positive ROI from social media? And, and we'll get into some of the details uh, about that. But what I am here to tell you is that social media is a reality. 
it's just a continual evolution. And so where social media was in 2010 is quite different from where it was in 2011. And even how we approach social media now, it is quite different. And for those uh, more financially focused, yes, you can generate a positive ROI. You just need to make sure you're focused in the right places and that you have the right people in the right locations. And we'll get into the details of where you should focus. Now, marketing has changed more over the past five years than it has over the last 50 years. And a lot of that is attributed to the Internet and really the Web 2.0 platform. A little bit later in the presentation, we'll get into some of the details on what exactly Web 2.0 is. But Web 2.0 has been the accelerator for social media and a lot of the changes that we're going to talk through. Now, from a marketing standpoint, the trend used to be that you would focus your marketing efforts on building brand. But with social media, it really has modernized the way that we approach, me, that we approach marketing. And really the focus now, especially with social media, is using it as a platform to get people engaged with your brand and interacting with your brand. Now, one of the misconceptions out there is that social media is for the young, and however you uh, define young, but it, it, it is a misconception. Facebook, as just one example, the fastest growing segment within Facebook are women of the age 55. And then Twitter, the average age of individuals leveraging Twitter, the average age is 35 to 49. Now, from a trend standpoint, there's really not a marketing campaign that I see out there within healthcare and even outside of healthcare that doesn't have a social media component to it. What's changed is the goals. And in the goals of social media, at least what I'm seeing in 2012, there's four main goals. The first one is to drive traffic. The second one is to drive sales and sales leads. The third major goal is to get individuals engaging with your brand. And then the fourth one that I really see increasing dramatically in 2012 is getting very targeted in your messaging. And so what I'm seeing healthcare organizations do, instead of just having a general social media website out there, they're starting to develop more and more targeted sites and more and more targeted forums to target things like arthritis, diabetes, uh, heart disease, or even developing forums for which their physician employees can, can share best practices. The other big trend that I'm seeing within healthcare is how success is measured. Typically how organizations measured success last year was how many friends do you have uh, connecting on your social media website, how many followers, how many likes. And really what I see right now is they're measuring success by looking at that engagement. So are they sharing the information? Are they forwarding the information? Are these organizations retweeting? And those are really examples of um, how engaged people are with your brand. Now, on the next slide, you'll see the social media landscape. And one thing that you'll see are there are so many places to focus, and there are so many different types of social media websites out there. But within healthcare, there's really four major focus areas. And, and I'll talk through what those areas are. And, and for those that aren't familiar with it, I'll just give you a quick education on what, what those four sites are all about. The first one is LinkedIn. And think about LinkedIn as a trade show when you go to different uh, healthcare events, different trade shows. LinkedIn is really your business side. It's where you have that business dialogue and you use more of that business language. And I'll give you an example. Right now I'm, at, I'm in Las Vegas at a health information management systems conference. And when I'm leveraging LinkedIn at this conference, 
it's all about reaching out and, and figuring out who my network is and, and what CIOs, what IT executives are here at this conference. And so I'm really leveraging the business side and the networking side of LinkedIn. Now, the second major area that healthcare organizations tend to focus on is Facebook. And think about Facebook as more of a pub or, or a bar type of scene. It's a lot more social, and it's, it's the place where you can show your personal side. And so at this conference, when I'm leveraging Facebook, I'm talking more about the fun things that I'm doing at the conference, like where I ate dinner last night or a fun lunch that I may have scheduled. Now, the third major website that healthcare organizations are leveraging, Twitter. And, and think about Twitter as a cocktail party, or, or I like to say a cocktail party with your kids there. It's very short, fragmented conversations. It's very concise conversations, and you may have multiple conversations going on at one time. And so at this conference, uh, individuals that I may be tweeting with include the media. H&HN &HN and, and Trustee are here. You've got Matt Weinstock, who's one of the chief editors for H&HN. &HN. I'm looking at what he's doing on Twitter, and I'm retweeting. There's also uh, Biz Stone here, who is one of the founders of Twitter. And so I'm out there on Twitter talking about his presentation, what a phenomenal job he's done with his presentation. And then the fourth major area of focus within healthcare is YouTube. And think about YouTube as New York City Times Square. There's so much interactivity, and there's a lot of competition for attention, and it's very hard to stand out on YouTube, but when you do, you can make a huge breakthrough. And so how I'm leveraging YouTube from this conference standpoint is I'm using it to stay informed, but I'm also looking for what is that one good video opportunity where I can pull out my phone and capture a video of some thought leadership from one of the CIOs that may be here that I can then take and put on our corporate YouTube page. And so really within healthcare, 70% of your healthcare organizations are leveraging LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And then for all of those other sites, those other sites are being used but typically it's less than 20%, and there's a very niche focus that, that is uh, enabling these organizations to use those sites. Now, on the next slide, what you'll see are the trends within the Web 2.0 platform and what healthcare organizations, from a functional standpoint, are really utilizing. And it's very simple. Most organizations, when they're using Web 2.0, they're leveraging the social networks, they're leveraging podcasts, they're leveraging forums, and they're starting to leverage more and more social texting capabilities. And so with Facebook, yeah, Facebook, you have about 750 million users worldwide, and it continues to grow. LinkedIn, you have about 120 million users, and LinkedIn is actually the fastest growing of the social media websites that are out there. And so those are really some of the more global social media trends that I'm seeing as, um, as we really get into 2012. Okay. Thanks, Christine. So, uh, Cody, uh, what about trends within the job market? What are you seeing? Well, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback Christine a little bit. There, of the four that she listed, there are really three significant uh, social media sites that are impacting the job market, and they're probably the three that you could guess. LinkedIn is by far the most prevalent of those. Uh, healthcare in general was a little bit slower to adopt LinkedIn, I think, than a lot of the other industries out there. But in the last couple of years especially, healthcare executives have – really picked up on LinkedIn, and the recruiters are following them there. Um, so I think that's a significant trend. And what LinkedIn has done is it's essentially leveled the playing field. Um, everyone has the same access and reach 
to an audience that they didn't have access to three years ago. So, for example, the, the corporate recruiter um, that is used to relying on referrals has the same reach as the third-party recruiter that's accustomed to doing their recruiting over the phone. So you're doing it faster. You're not going through a significant calling campaign or anything like that as a recruiter. You have the same reach to that audience, and you're doing it in a much uh, faster time frame. And what they're getting access to is not like a traditional job board on LinkedIn where you're only receiving the folks that are actively interested in pursuing a job. You're reaching out to the people that are technically supposed to be happy in their job and are comfortable doing what they're doing, but uh, it's a passive audience that recruiters are now trying to talk into to moving into a new career path. So it's just really opened up um, opportunities for everybody to be working on the same level and require the people that have more skill at doing what they're doing, um, or has it allowed them to, to target some of those better um, executives. Facebook and Twitter have really been leveraged more to help build their brand, um, and, and specifically their employment brand. There's not a lot of healthcare executives out there unless they're out there to, to keep an eye on their children or to monitor grandchildren, but there, there is a lot of people within healthcare that are on Facebook and Twitter, and so they're using that as an opportunity to market the information that's important to them, um, but not necessarily as a recruiting tool, especially with healthcare executives. But LinkedIn is by far the most direct and popular recruiting tool on social media. Okay. So Cheryl, there has to be some uh, legal thoughts. So from a legal point of point of view, what social media trends uh, should we be aware of? Sure. I'm afraid my role today is probably going to scare some of you. <laughs> it seems that when I do these presentations that uh, uh, I'm the one that sits there and tells you what you shouldn't be doing, and a lot of people go, uh-oh, I'm already doing that. Um, what I've seen is exponential growth in social media, just to echo my fellow speakers here, especially by healthcare providers for the general public and employees both on proprietary websites and on, uh, that they own themselves and also on third-party websites. Um, the most recent numbers show that just hospitals, more than 1,200 hospitals are using social networking tools right now, and over 41 hospitals are using social networking sites, whether it be on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Um, and I'm sure it's even greater when you look at all the other healthcare providers that are out there. Um, and whether you want to participate in it or not, the, the reality is, as Christine put it, it is a reality. There's even a greater growth of blogs by unrelated entities that may rate, review, comment, or criticize healthcare providers. And so um, it's probably important to get in front of that horse rather than uh, wait until someone has, uh, you don't have a forum to respond to that. Um, also, in my field, I see a lot of internet marketing to a global audience becoming more important than just marketing to the local population. Obviously, there are specialty treatment centers and healthcare providers and that draw from all over the United States, um, such as like the Mayo Clinic. And so uh, for those organizations, it becomes very important to um, make sure they have a solid social media uh, policy and they're using their um, communication methods appropriately. And to um, whether you're an employer or an individual looking for placement, it's important that you have savvy when it comes to privacy and intellectual property and how you use these social media sites. Um, to steal from Tim Rustard, I guess I would emphasize privacy, 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 right? There are new risks for liability potentially involving HIPAA as well as copyrights and trademark rights um, when it comes to lawyers. And as someone looking for placement, it's important that you don't appear to be um, misusing that intellectual property or violating privacy, obviously, if you're looking for a job in the field. Um, and the things that I'm seeing in my personal practice are that privacy and security training are becoming an annual requirement of um, staff because, as it's already been alluded to, social media is constantly evolving and you have to keep on top of it. And, and often, uh, if you only do a presentation once a year or training, um, that, is, that is important. But if you don't do it at least annually, obviously, you may be behind the curveball. Also, I'm seeing that healthcare organizations are increasingly considering cyber liability insurance um, to help pr protect them from liability for the actions, perhaps, of their employees. So that's from a legal perspective. Okay. So the title of this webinar, Healthcare Executive Career Management in a Web 2.0 Era. Christine, I hear a lot of hype around Web 2.0. 
So what is what exactly is this web 2.0 and why is it important to everyone on this call? Oh, you bet. Uh, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll spend a minute on what Web.1.0 is, and, and then we'll spend some time on Web 2.0. Web 1.0, basically, that, that is your simple, static websites. It's, it's the, tra the traditional uh, screen by screen where there's no interaction, there's no collaboration. Literally, all you do is view content. An example of that is Encyclopedia Britannica Online. And you have content that's written by an expert, and maybe content's updated every quarter, perhaps twice a year, but there's no interaction whatsoever. And so it's more of a monologue. Now, Web 2.0, it allows users to interact, to collaborate with each other, to do things like social media dialogue. And it's, it truly is more of that dialogue. It's not the passive type of interaction that you see with Web 1.0. And an example that's really the opposite of Encyclopedia Britannica, that's a Web 2.0, is Wikipedia. And so if you've ever been out to Wikipedia, you have a lot of different people that are authoring the content. And, and you don't have that one expert. You have a lot of experts. And it's, it's updated real time. You can build your communities around it. It's just highly collaborative. Now, if you look at the next slide, Web 2.0, it's it's a lot of things, and, and it can be very confusing and very complex, but truly in its simplest terms, think about Web 2.0 as the platform that allows for collaboration and things like blogs and wikis and, and um, just different interactive web applications. Now, one of the things that I do start hearing more and more about now is Web 3.0. And, and again, there's so many different definitions out there on Web, web 3.0 is, but in its most simplest terms, I try to think about Web 3.0 as the convergence of the virtual world and the physical world. So it's really where you start getting into 3D simulations and augmented reality type of gaming. And we are starting to see a little bit more and more out there, but it, it seems to be more in that alpha and beta state than anything that you really see healthcare organizations engaging in. Now on the next slide, this is an example of the true manifestation of Web 2.0. And it really is the fundamental shift in the way that we communicate and share opinions, share ideas, and share experiences. And it's all about the conversation. So not only does it give you the opportunity to share information, it also gives you an opportunity to really listen and to listen to what's happening out there. Now, I won't get into everything that's on here, but I'll just point out a, a couple of things. And, and you truly have to think about your organization, but yourself personally, and really look at what your intentions are. And based on those atten intentions, it will help you focus in on what you should be doing in the Web 2.0 environment. The things you'll see are, and, and you may hear some buzz around, crowdsourced. And really what that is, is you're pulling talent from all over the world to contribute to something in common. You see this a lot in the development world with things like open source coding. Blog platforms are really starting to grow within healthcare. And, and it's like a digital magazine or more like a diary. It's a lot more informal. It's a lot more chatty. We're also seeing more and more aggregators out there. And there seems to be a lot of competition for these aggregators. And aggregators really pull content from multiple sites and aggregate them into one location. We're also seeing wikis being used a lot more. And Wikipedia, again, is a great example of this. And it's, wikis are their sites that allow large groups to write content and edit content real time. 
And then the other thing that seems to be growing because it, it really helps look at that engagement factor with your brand are tags. And think about tags as the online version of yellow sticky notes, but tags also now give you the ability to let others know what you like and, and what you're interested in. So as you're getting more targeted in your messaging, you can look at these to see what your users and what your customers are truly interested in. Thanks, Christine. Cody, so as a recruiter, but also um, as an expert that works with employers every day, how are these tools being used by rec recruiters and employers? Well, I'll start with uh, Facebook and Twitter to answer that question. They, they kind of get lumped together oftentimes by recruiters and how they're being utilized. Uh, one thing they can be is a, a way to reconnect with people they already know. It's a little bit challenging to, to seek out healthcare executives on Facebook and Twitter if you don't already know their healthcare executives. If they're really providing a lot of information about their field, then you can seek them out through some search strings, but it's, it's hard to connect with them if you don't already know in advance their um, the healthcare executive. So it's more utilized to connect with people you know from the past uh, and haven't been able to catch up with for a while. What they are doing, hiring organizations are using Facebook and Twitter in the vetting process. Um, so after a successful interview, it's almost guaranteed that they're going to go out to Facebook, they're going to go out to Twitter, um, LinkedIn, they're going to Google the person's name, and they're going to be seeing if there's anything that stands out to them that would um, force them to shy away from uh, hiring that individual. So professionalism on those sites is a must. Like I said earlier, they're also using Facebook and Twitter to develop their employment brand, and that's more the hospital and the individual health systems that are leveraging those. And again, I don't know that those are targeting as much the healthcare executives. They're going to have different opportunities through the interview process and other connections that help them understand the culture of an organization. A staff nurse that's um, newly entering the field may get influenced a great deal by um, an organization's social side and how they're trying to promote themselves. Recruiters will use things outside of even Facebook and Twitter, but blogs, um, anything that will give them a chance to separate themselves, they'll put information out there that puts them out there as a thought leader or an expert in their field because that will stimulate conversation with the people that they're ultimately trying to recruit. So they will use Facebook and Twitter in that regard some. Um, LinkedIn is used, and again, it's the most common um, social site because healthcare executives have adopted it, and it's essentially being used as an, another email platform. Most organizations now have found value in upgrading their LinkedIn accounts that allows them to what are called, send what are called in-mails. And so they can send out a, a limited number of in-mails to the audience they're targeting each day um, or each month, and they're getting access to people that they would have had to have an email in the past or a phone number to get directly to. So when you purchase the what are called recruiter professional accounts, it opens up visibility into the profiles of every person on LinkedIn. It doesn't always provide a name, but they know based on their background that they may be a good target for them for their specific job. So it's essentially become an email platform just in a different system, a different environment. And for some reason, the recruiters that are on there have, uh, I think, found more comfort there and are a little bit more creative in their messaging to try to stir up conversation that will allow them to begin talking about a specific job down the road. Um, and, and they're using it to, to find talent connected to people in their own organization. So a corporate recruiter that in the past had a referral bonus program where they were getting referrals from all the other colleagues in the organization and would go out and reach out to them for a specific opening, they don't need that anymore. They're more than likely going to be connected to that individual already in their organization, and through that connection, they have visibility into their peers and their colleagues that are in their network. So it almost leads to referral bonus programs if they are still in your organization going away because the recruiters aren't going to need that kind of access in the future. They're already going to be able to get it just by connecting to their peers in the organization. So, so Cody, as a job seeker, 
what practices should be adopted to maximize visibility then? Um, well, I think that's the, the key to everything you're doing. If you, you want to be noticed and you want to manage your career uh, leveraging social media, and the biggest one is LinkedIn. That's essentially your online resume that everybody can get access to through one means or another. So I think you want to do some simple things first and make sure your profile is complete, um, include a headline on there, include a professional photo. Uh, recommendations are good if you can get them from past or current coworkers. Um, I would tend to shy away from getting personal references and having them on your LinkedIn page. Keep that professional. Um, start building your network first if you haven't already by finding the people that you already know. Like I said, your colleagues in healthcare are out there, and more likely than not, if there's someone that you haven't connected with for a while that you would like to reconnect with, they're going to be on LinkedIn. Um, I would join groups, one, because that also opens up your network even further. Everybody that's already in that group, you're going to have visibility into their profiles. But also, it provides you information on what's occurring in your market or in your field. Um, ACHE, for example, has their, their national group has already got over 3,300 members. So that's over 3,000 people that immediately you can get insight into um, or try to connect with to, to explore career opportunities. Um, and be active on those groups. If there's a topic or a discussion that pops up that you are an expert on, provide um, some feedback to the discussion groups and be active in there because it's going to get you noticed by the recruiters that might be uh, a part of those groups. Um, give to your network. It's, it's just as any um, network you have, the more you support them, the more likely they're going to be to, to give back to you. So um, if they have a request or are seeking um, a resource that you have access to, work with them and share with them because they're going to provide that same support to you when you need it. The, the biggest thing here would be keywords. Um, keywords are oftentimes something that you're not thinking of. But from a recruiter's perspective, when we're looking for um, somebody that has lean experience, that's going to be part of our search stream or somebody that's implemented an EMR. We're going to put that in our search string if the, the organization that we're working for or with wants that experience. So if you don't have that in your profile, um, no one's going to see your background. So if you want to be noticed, um, Make sure you have those keywords flushed throughout your entire profile. And again, treat it almost as if it were your resume. Um, when you're working with non-recruiters, I would recommend not immediately identifying yourself as someone that's seeking a position if you are indeed seeking a position. Um, I, I think that's okay with recruiters, and their recruiters are all over LinkedIn, so you can find recruiters that do uh, searches like you're looking for. Um, but, but find a connection point with the folks that aren't necessarily in recruiting now that can begin to form a relationship, and then down the road you can bring up the thought of um, career management and what your goals are. With, with Facebook and Twitter, I'd really focus on one thing here. Anytime I'm talking to somebody that's looking at managing their career and they're trying to continue to grow, um, I, I tell them to try to pick 10 organizations at least that they could see themselves working at and try to find a way to get yourself integrated or connected to people within those organizations so that you have a presence there and people within that organization know you who you are, know what you do, and know what you're about. And, and Facebook and Twitter are a great way to make that initial connection because you can start following those organizations and they're going to put the information out there that's important to them. And so if it's important to them and you make it important to you, that's the ammunition for you to use to stimulate conversation between you and anybody else you're reaching out to, likely through, through LinkedIn. It can spark conversation. So um, be visible, use keywords, and, and be active when you can. Just don't overutilize um, as you're networking. Sure. Thanks. So Cheryl, uh, from a legal perspective, what considerations should employers uh, consider as well as job seekers? Uh, what should they keep top of mind? Well, to follow up on what Cody was discussing with job seekers, I mean, I think it really comes down to using common sense with social media. Um, obviously, from, and this, I don't know if this is necessarily legal, but from a job seeking standpoint, you don't want to post scandalous material or crazy profile pictures, uh, at least without using appropriate security measures. Um, 
you know, one of the, the two issues that seem to come up in this field from job seeker st standpoint is they're so active, perhaps they have their own blog or they're blogging or they're reviewing things, trying to get connected to the particular positions they may want, that sometimes they sacrifice privacy or intellectual property rights. And so it's very important that um, the job seeker be cognizant of that. For instance, and we'll talk about this more uh, in the context of healthcare providers later on, but um, obviously anybody who provides healthcare services is, um, and, and their associates are um, bound by the rules of HIPAA. And um, there are some opportunities I've seen where individuals have posted information that really would be deemed private by a patient to kind of show maybe a treatment they gave or a, a successful outcome. And so um, doing that and disclosing that without proper permission um, obviously could expose you to liability. And it tells employers that um, you may not be very savvy about that and you might be a potential liability for them. Um, secondly, the other big one that comes up is copyright. Um, Copyright protects the expression in a work. It doesn't protect the idea or the concept, but it protects the way something is written or drawn. Um, and so what happens sometimes is, and, and it's happening all the time, and of course it's incumbent upon the copyright owner to enforce um, its rights, but uh, what happens is instead of just linking to something that you may want to post on your blog, people are cutting and pasting, uploading videos, copying content, without getting proper permission. And um, there seems to be this thought out there that just because it's on the internet, it's somehow available for copying and pasting and it's not protected. And that's just not the case. Copyright exists upon creation, regardless of whether the copyright owner has sought a registration. And so therefore, the rule of thumb should be that you should presume that information is copyrighted and that unless you get permission, you shouldn't be copying and pasting it or uploading videos without permission of the copyright owner. And of course, um, you know, that happens a lot. But again, for somebody who's trying to get a job, an employer may look at that and go, depending on what your position is, like if you're going to be in charge of marketing or social media or, or you're uh, intended to blog on behalf of the company, um, that you might be a potential li uh, a liability. And so again, you want to do what you can to minimize that. From an employer standpoint, you know, where do I begin? Um, Hiring practices are critical. If you're going to review social media as part of your hiring practice, I have to say it's safer to do that until you've had a, after you've had a face-to-face -face interview. You're less likely to be accused of making a decision based on protected characteristics that are evident from an online profile, such as race, age, disability. Once you review a candidate's online profile, a court will assume you're aware of that person's protected characteristics that are often part of their online posting. Um, you might be aware of their religion and that kind of thing. So frankly, it's safer for an employer to not look at those profiles um, until after you've had an interview or have already had some sort of meeting, hopefully face-to-face. -face. Of course, in this day and age, it doesn't always happen. Now, if you decide to use social media in your recruiting process, you should do a couple things to minimize your exposure to potential liability. First, you should make sure that you conduct the same searches at the same point in the process for every applicant. Obviously. If you're doing that inconsistently, um, then a jury could infer something negative from that. So you should have a consistent practice in place of when you're going to pursue and look at their uh, social media profiles. And secondly, I would encourage you to print or save screenshots if you see something that causes you to question the candidate's candidate, professionalism, competence, or judgment. And so. Um, that way, you don't have to think back and, and say you relied on something that didn't exist. If there's something that concerns you in their profile or their online resume, then you should retain a copy of that um, just, just to avoid further exposure to liability. Um, so while social media, in my opinion, should not be used to make final employment decisions, it certainly can be used as an extension of a resume, a conversation starter that gives the interviewer a, a deeper understanding of the candidate. Just remember, your questions still have to remain legal regardless of what the applicant discloses online, and that's really important. Sometimes people reveal things about themselves, um, and it, it may seem that they've you know, decided to go ahead and, and, and disclose that in a way that it would be okay for you to ask those questions. Unfortunately, the law is still the law, and it doesn't change the fact that you can't ask someone if they're married or a smoker or those kinds of things, and so you should be weary of that. Um, at a minimum, you should make sure that whatever materials your company posts 
are accurate and legal, which is I think pretty straightforward. Things to consider are make sure that your company's profile states that the business is an equal opportunity employer. Also, you should know exactly, and this is really important, I can tell you how many times in litigation this comes up, you should know in your company or whether a third party vendor is able to add or to change content on the company's profile, and that will be seen as uh, much more important later on. And make sure that it is consistent with other marketing and advertising messages. So that pretty much sums that up. Okay, great. So let's, we've mentioned online uh, identity, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Cody, tell me about building a positive identity uh, as well as things to avoid that will build a negative identity. Sure. Um, the, the three main sites that we've kind of all been talking about, there's pretty clear distinction between what's considered a professional site and what's considered personal. LinkedIn has kind of become the professional um, networking site, and Facebook and Twitter have uh, traditionally been more about the personal side of things. LinkedIn has, in the, or in the recent um, couple of years, started to trend more toward becoming a recruiting site, though. They didn't promote that in the past and still probably don't promote that to the broad audience today, um, but they didn't used to give any flexibility to recruiters on that site whatsoever, um, and now they're almost pushing toward a recruiting site. So I would say not to shy away from that. Um, you'll have recruiters contacting you probably weekly and you may not want a job from them today, you may be perfectly content in the position that you're in, but three or four years from now, that person could have the job that you do want. And so the more you can support them, um, if you know somebody that is looking for a position and can support them in helping make that connection, um, the more likely they're gonna be to support you in the future. What you shouldn't do is overuse LinkedIn. Um, I think we've all had that person in our network that we get daily updates from about, um, you know, what kind of coffee they just ordered, and that kind of thing is, is perfectly fine on the Facebook and Twitter side, but for the LinkedIn side, it's something that you should try to avoid. And on the Facebook and Twitter group, um, that's where you can express yourself. You can be a little bit more um, personal. One thing I would recommend is securing your Facebook page so that you're only allowing those that are, you're connected to to view it or just avoiding controversial topics altogether. By putting information out there that has two sides, um, there's always going to be somebody from that other side. So you don't want a potential employer reviewing that and seeing that um, you stand in stark contrast to what their views are. Um, but the prevailing uh, standard that Cheryl alluded to is just use common sense and uh, you'll be fine with all of them. Okay, great. So now we're building this identity. Um, now I need to figure out how to go about building my online network and getting myself in the right places and not the wrong places. Um, Christine, what are your thoughts in regards to this? Well, I'm going to just echo what Cody has stated, but, but even simplify a little bit more. The biggest thing with building your network is getting focused. And, and again, there's so many places where you can be. There's so many places you can build your network, but, but get focused on truly those few sites and those few groups, those few companies where you can actually get connected and know, be very calculated, know exactly who you want to target, both from an organizational standpoint, but also from an individual standpoint. And it's okay if you, if you don't know someone that well or you're just wanting to build a relationship, it's okay to put yourself out there and, and let them know that you're interested in their organization or getting, wanting to learn a little bit more about them. It's okay to do that. The second thing is use your network to find out who they're networked with. And so if you want to get into a specific organization, get one connection there and see who those individuals are connected with and leverage their network as well. Christine, so you, you've led branding for several Fortune 100 companies inside of healthcare and outside of healthcare. You've also coached individuals on building their own individual brand. What would your guidance be for us today regarding branding 
uh, in a Web 2.0 era. Well, let's take a look at the next slide. Basically, social media social media can be a very effective tool for influencing your brand, whether it's at an organizational level or personal level, but also building awareness. The coaching I usually give individuals is focus, build the brand around your career and your desires and, and, and where you want to be, not necessarily on the job that you have at hand. So think about building it for tomorrow and not necessarily focusing on the descriptor of the job you have today. Think through you know, four simple things. What is the goal and what are you trying to accomplish? On the execution side, what are the best sites that are going to help me accomplish this goal? Then think through what are the tones I need to use and what are those right words? And as Cody said, load it up with keywords. Find those keywords that you think the recruiters will be looking for or your patients will be looking for, and then measure your success. The fun thing about social media, you can always change your tone. You can change those words. So constantly measure your success and, and always try to evolve so you, you get closer and closer to that goal. When I coach individuals on building their network and building their brands, I really simplify it to four simple things. The first thing in creating your online identity, the first thing to do, start blogging. You, if you've got something meaningful to say, put it out there. And it's a great example of how well you write. It's a great example of how savvy you are with social media, but it also helps demonstrate your intelligence. The second thing is create a LinkedIn profile. And even if you have a profile out there, after this webinar, go back and revisit that, that profile. 86% of recruiters leverage LinkedIn to find candidates for their organization. And also, Google highly favors LinkedIn, so you want to have a good presence out there so you can be found. And just you know, make sure you have a picture out there. Make sure your resume is out there, have your bio, and get connected to some groups. The third to-do that I would put on your list, get on Twitter. And, and Twitter is a little, it's just, it's a little bit different. It's slightly uncomfortable when you first get out there, but it is a phenomenal way to extend your network and, again, show your brilliance. One of the things I, I try to uh, encourage individuals to do when you're getting on Twitter Create a handle for yourself that's self-identifying. So for myself, based on who I'm trying to connect with through Twitter, I may have my name, Christine Ricci, as my handle. Or if I'm trying to really break into healthcare, I may have my last name, Ricci, and then healthcare. And it's just a really good way to connect with other thought leaders. It's a good way also to connect with, with the media. And then the fourth thing I would encourage is Facebook. Build a Facebook presence. They're almost at 1 billion users, and it's a great way to build your personal brand. And we do have a white paper. Um, if, if you want some of the details on any of the things that we're talking through, we do have a white paper that uh, Jamie would be happy to distribute. So. And that's really, those are the main things that I would focus on for building your network and building your brand. Okay. So, Cheryl, from a, from a legal perspective or even from your expert point of view, tell us about the legal considerations for corporate branding and Web 2.0 era. Yeah, there are several, but I'll just hit on the ones I think are probably most pertinent right now. Um, Obviously, we've been talking about brands. Uh, another word that comes to mind, of course, is trademarks. They practice the field trademark law. And any time you have, an, uh, and most of you probably know this, a company name, a slogan, an icon, obviously that's my source identifier of your organization. And so that you can get trademark protection for that. You automatically have trademark rights as you use them in commerce. And in, if you didn't do anything else but use the trademarks, you'd have rights uh, rights geographically to where you provide services. So an easy location, or, you know, geographic scope would probably be where you're located, where your facility is. 
um, it's possible that you do regular business uh, in another state, and so you may have common law rights there. But I would encourage our listeners to consider getting federal trademark protection in light of especially our conversation today. Um, registrations can greatly aid you in your brand protection efforts on social media sites, domain names, et cetera. Um, let me just give you a taste of what that means. If you have a federal trademark registration, you often get to take advantage of the sunrise period where you can be the first to register new top-level domain names that come up. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with .com and .edu and .net and .org, but there's also .XXX. Well, maybe you're concerned that someone's going to register your trademark with .XXX. If you have a registration, you would have been able to take advantage of a period where you could block others from registering that domain name with .XXX. Additionally, as many listeners are probably aware, uh, the international um, organization that registers or, or permits uh, companies to be registrars is now allowing new top-level domains. And right now there's a campaign going on, and, and we don't know. Um, after April we'll find out which ones, but people are going to be trying to register .hospital, .doctor, .school, .car, .jewelry, maybe even .nike. And so if you want to be able to protect your trademark and avoid this from getting in the hands of others, Having a registration allows you to take advantage of the sunrise period where you can block others from obtaining a trademark or domain name with your trademark in it. Um, secondly, um, if you have a registered trademark um, and someone's misusing your trademark on a social media site, I've had this for clients where someone will come up with a Twitter ID or a Facebook uh, page that incorporates my client's trademarks, and it's confusing to online users. If you have a trademark registration, a lot of these social media sites will have complaint processes where you can, without having to hire a lawyer, file a complaint online and they'll take it down. But if you don't have a registration, guess what? You're out of luck. A third example of this is online advertising, um, and I'm, it's becoming much, much more prevalent in the healthcare field than it ever has before. Um, so for instance, if I'm a competitor, I might buy my competitor's um, uh, name as a keyword, and every time someone online searches for my competitor, guess what? My, my advertisement shows up. If you are misusing your competitor's trademarks by putting them in the title or text of that sponsored advertisement, guess what? If you have a registered trademark, you can have it shut down on Google, and Bing and Yahoo, which are owned by the same company, have a similar process. So having a trademark registration can greatly enhance the value of your company and give you leverage in social media that you would not otherwise have. Um, additionally, and alluding to uh, uh, purchasing keywords, you should have a sound SEO practice in place uh, with either your internal marketing firms or outside marketing firms. And what I mean by SEO is search engine optimization, of course. You want to make sure that you're careful about how you use the trademarks of others, and obviously you want to keep the white hat on, and uh, make sure that there's a process for constructing and maintaining and exploiting the brand. I mean, that's just important from a legal perspective to make sure that you're doing that in a way that doesn't encroach on someone else's rights, but also make sure that you're uh, exploiting the value of your own trademarks. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, Cheryl, so how, how does that translate for human resources policy? Well, and th now we're going to shift gears a little bit. So in this instance, now we're going to talk about uh, privacy and the, the number one issue that's facing healthcare providers with social media, and that's HIPAA, of course, and trying to make sure that you're um, uh, making sh uh, you're not violating anyone's personal health information. So from an HR perspective, we'll talk about first, you need to approach uh, you need to take a, a personal view of social media in the workplace. You need to limit liability by establishing clear procedures and policies. And um, a lot of people are slow to get up to speed on this. And again, I would consider annual review, but I would highly consider that each organization have a social media policy. Perhaps you don't want your employees um, posting on uh, any pages about what they're doing at work. Or perhaps you do, but you want them only to do it on your Facebook page or only on your proprietary website. And perhaps you want people to promote what a great place it is to work and all of that. Those kinds of procedures and policies should be spelled out in writing. Frankly, I would make them part of any sort of employment agreement or an employee manual as appropriate. You should determine a coherent set of internal and external policies and procedures regarding patient privacy that are tailored to your organization. And again, I can't emphasize enough, you need to review and revise them as needed. Um, with the way social media is evolving, um, you've got to make sure that, that your policy doesn't become obsolete. It should be reviewed. 
Now, I will say, um, when drafting these for clients, I always have to caution my employer clients to be wary of First Amendment rights. You want to make sure you're not, especially if you have any union workers and that kind of thing, you want to make sure that you're allowing the freedom of expression to continue in a way that doesn't violate other laws. Um, so, for instance, the policy should you know, very easily explain the appropriate use of social media platforms, clearly define how information posted there will be used, and specify what kind of degree can be, uh, privacy can be expected, both for your employees and, 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 uh, and from anyone internally, officers and, and board members. Also, state clearly that the forums are not to be used for personal medical advice, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, that's probably one of the most dangerous areas when it comes to human resources. And well, let me add one more thing. I would recommend, there's a website put out by Ed Bennett, some of you may be familiar with, and he has actually collected a variety of social media policies from all different healthcare organizations. And I uh, don't have the exact website URL in front of me, but it's Ed Bennett, and if you search that in social media policies, he'll pop up, and he, he specializes with that information in the healthcare field. Okay, Jill. So. I uh, appreciate that. What is the organizational risk? Well, we've talked about some of that with privacy. Um, I will tell you the, the dark side of social media is that potential exposure for healthcare providers is going to grow. As more physicians and healthcare organizations move to social media, its misuse or its uh, the risk of misuse will increase the exposure of personal health information. Also, and this is what seems to be happening more, it increases the risk of practicing medicine online. Um, one individual, Andre, I believe, asked a question about examples of using LinkedIn for reaching out to patients. And I have to tell you, as a lawyer, I have real concerns about that. Um, I would recommend that you not practice medicine online or not give advice over email or any social media, um, even if the patient uh, discloses some of their personal health information, again, that doesn't give the healthcare provider the right to um, do that as well. And so, for instance, there were some examples recently where some healthcare workers are posting sensitive information about a patient on Facebook page and they lost their jobs. Also, an EMT t in Staten Island took photos of a murder victim and posted them online. Um, these are serious, serious violations of HIPAA and for employers, <laughs> You obviously want to educate your employees and your contractors to make sure that they're using social media in a responsible way. Um, we saw in 2011 that class, class action litigation increased, and largely that was due to the fact that patients were suing healthcare organizations for failing to protect their personal health information, um, and also some of which involved business associates and breached patient data, and this includes firms that handle billing for um, healthcare providers and anyone else who had access to those records. So you want to make sure that you have a sound social media policy that addresses not only your employees, but also the public. You want to make sure that they know what they're allowed to do on your social media sites. If they post something private, um, again, it doesn't mean you should answer it online. In fact, in your social media policy, I would strongly recommend that you have a, a provision that states that at any time, for any reason, at your complete discretion, you can take down any postings um, on your LinkedIn page, your Facebook wall, um, on Twitter, whatever you want, so that if someone does perhaps cross the line and um, exposes uh, someone else's personal health information or asks about themselves, you can take it down and you can contact them directly if need be. Um, I would recommend that you don't contact them um, of course, on any public line. And this happened recently. There was a case where a child had posted on a hospital webpage blog and asked about how her sick friend was doing. And that, of course, friend was a minor, and of course, she doesn't have capacity to consent to the disclosure of her personal health information. Her parents were upset about it. So, as a hospital or any sort of healthcare provider, if you're going to allow people to post on your blogs or web pages, you've got to make sure that you um, are having somebody monitor it <laughs> all the time. The things should be taken down if, they, if it's suspected that they might violate personal health information or disclose that inappropriately. A um, couple things you can do, best practices. One is uh, one thing I do want to make sure you all know. Is that under the Communications Decency Act, it protects you as a sponsor of an online forum. A healthcare provider 
cannot be held liable for postings made by other parties just because it owns or sponsors the forum. Now, that doesn't, that's for lewdness or slander. It doesn't deal with necessarily privacy because obviously that still applies. I would also encourage you, if you find something that you think is concerned, you're better off removing the posting entirely than editing it. If you edit a third party's post, then you become a co-author and you can also assume liability. Um, there may be situations where you don't want to have people post online at all and you want to make sure that they avoid it. So that's something to be think about as well. Um, another measure is to ensure that employees are not visiting social networking sites from computers at the office in case that's not part of their job. Um, lastly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the FTC Act. And um, the FTC has some guidelines about logging online um, to promote yourself. There are certain employees in the field that are hired to go out there and say, this is a great place to work, and they're being paid to do that, or they get free services. Um, just, and I don't want to spend too much time on that because I don't think it's as big in this particular field as in other fields, but just know there are FTC guidelines that state that you must disclose um, that you are affiliated or being compensated by an, a company if they're paying you or any organization to promote their goods or services online um, in a commercial sense. So, important things to know. Okay, great. Well, I know I've learned a lot, um, and I know that some of you may still have questions. Uh, as Christine mentioned earlier, if you'd like any white papers or additional articles on this, any of the information you heard today, uh, you know, please let me know, and uh, I'm happy to, to connect the dots and get the information that you need. So what we'd like to do now is actually turn it over to you. We've had a handful of questions that have came in, and um, I'll actually start going through some of these questions and pointing them back to our panel to, to, to answer them. But if you have questions, uh, please uh, submit them via the, the, the text box that you can type into, um, or you can um, hit star six to unmute your line and, and ask a question as well. And I think there's a moderator that will, will help with help facilitate those questions. But let's um, let me go back to um, Cheryl was just addressing a question on LinkedIn about um, examples of use, and, and you mentioned not using. Not you know, giving that right, right, right. Which makes sense. If someone came back with a question, it may be the uh, the same person asked the original question. But in regards to um, reaching out to patients, was thinking of educational efforts, not necessarily the clinical. So using it in an educational form. You know, what are the thoughts around that? Because I actually saw an article this morning on on one of my web links that came in that talked about a physician out in Seattle that was doing more social media blogging and using that as a form to to get specific points of information out, but not anything directed at a particular, particular patient. Absolutely. Um, and we deal with this in the legal field, too. When we post something and we have a blog going on, a particular issue, we always have a disclaimer that this is not serving as legal advice, this is just information we want to share with you. It isn't unusual and it's growing exponentially where healthcare providers are providing educational information on their own blogs. And again, as long as you're not treating individual patients, I would, I would strongly encourage you have some sort of notice or disclaimer on it that says that you should not be, you should consult your own doctor, of course, and you should not consider this medical advice, that this is just intended for educational purposes, um, and, and that kind of thing. You probably want to check with your insurance carrier to make sure they're okay with the way in which you are conducting yourself online um, to make sure that you have coverage in case anyone does ever uh, allege malpractice. But um, from a purely educational standpoint, absolutely. If you want to blog about that and reach out to a particular group of patients that might all share some sort of um, health issue or have some uh, interest in a health issue, um, as long as it's done uh, at a 10,000 foot view and not uh, directed at any one individual without their permission, then I, I believe that your liability is greatly diminished, your exposure to that. Okay. So Christine, I think this next question might be for you and then I'll let the rest of the group chime in as well. Uh, but what are some organizations that seem to be doing a good job with social media, so any that you might know of? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say, I mean, there's several that have, have really grown in their capabilities. Uh, Children's Hospital in Boston, 
they have about 700,000 users. So that's one I'd recommend taking a look at more from how um, they've been able to engage their community uh, with their social media sites. Uh, Regional Hospital in Minnesota, they do a lot with video and YouTube, so they'd be a good one to look at. Also, they leverage Facebook in a way I've not necessarily seen others leverage Facebook. They tend to do a lot of promotional things uh, through Facebook, one from a patient standpoint, but also from a retail standpoint where they'll have a buy a coffee, get one free type of promotion. Uh, they also do a good job uh, focusing on public health issues. So Regional Hospital Minnesota uh, also, uh, Henry Ford, Aurora Healthcare, Mayo Clinic, and Cleveland Clinic, they've been doing social media for for a bit longer, so they seem to have it a lot more refined as far as, uh, again, their reach with the patient population. It's, it's interesting, and I saw a link come across in some of the chat where last year, October time frame, there were 1,200 healthcare organizations engaged in social media, but I also just recently saw a stat uh, as of February 20th where nearly 4,000 healthcare organizations are engaged in social media. So you see more and more organizations getting out there. But uh, the ones that I mentioned, they've been out there for a while longer. So those are the ones I'd recommend taking a look at. So, Cody, I believe this question will be for you. And the question is, isn't using LinkedIn for recruiting a bit risky? You may miss many great candidates who don't have a profile. So how would you respond to that? Sure. No, I think think any of these things that we've shared are a piece of a bigger pie. I think LinkedIn is one of the tools you should use to recruit. Um, I think your network should be leveraged. Um, I think you should reach out for referrals. I think you should be on the phone. Um, Appropriate job boards may still be appropriate at times. I think it's just one piece of of a bigger puzzle that you you can use when you're trying to target people that are appropriate for your position. And my personal belief is that the more access you have to a given person, they may be on their email eight hours a day. And if that's the case, you want to hit them on email. They may be by their phone or have their cell phone with them um, at all times and may be very accessible that way. Or they may be an avid LinkedIn user, and that may be the best way for you to get um, a quick response. So I think it's a piece piece of it, but I don't think you should limit yourself just to LinkedIn by any means. Okay. Okay, so this question I'll throw out to the group, and if uh, Christine, Cody, Cheryl, if any one of you want to answer or take a stab at this one, let me know. We are... So the question is, is we are looking to start in social media. Uh, Where's the best place to start? Is it Facebook, LinkedIn? Should I start blogging? You know, so is is there any one particular form here better than the other? I'll jump in first. I guess it depends a little bit on the purpose and what objective you're trying to achieve. Um, If you're an individual and you're looking for a job, Um, by far LinkedIn is going to be your best approach. If you're a corporation looking to attract followers and and develop a brand, Facebook would be the way to go. So I think it depends a little bit on what your objective is. This is Christine. I I agree with Cody. I think um, if if you really clearly understand, again, what you're trying to accomplish, but where the majority of the organizations are, it's LinkedIn and Facebook. And so if you can get some experience under your belt with those two websites, then it might be easier to then jump into Twitter and and then start looking at YouTube. But LinkedIn and Facebook, that will be a good way to get your your feet wet. Yeah, from what I see, I mean, I think if anyone were looking for you, they would go to Facebook first. So it's almost expected that you would have a presence there, at least from a – an organization perspective, maybe not as a job seeker. Um, the other thing I would say I see becoming more popular are so many uh, social networking sites geared towards specific uh, fields of practice and businesses and that kind of thing. I know I have one 
I work with a client on, that does um, for CPAs and accountants, and depending on what your goals are, this, you, know, you might want to look at one that's targeted towards the industry. Um, and I don't necessarily know what all those are for you guys, but uh, definitely that might consider being more strategic in, in where you choose to be. Okay. So, um, and I think this question is probably for you, Cheryl, but I think many can answer it. Is, is it okay to contact an HR person on LinkedIn? Is there anything that we need to be concerned about here, Cody, Cheryl? No, I would say no. I mean, again, if I were uh, a job seeker, I would probably not reach out to them to say, hey, I'm a job seeker, look at me. Um, I would reach out to them and try to connect with them on a more personal level or um, talk to them about their business or their hospital first. Um, and hope to establish some kind of communication or conversation that you can then turn into a dialogue about your career. Um, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with reaching out to them. Okay. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. Obviously, you want to make sure you're not, um, from an HR perspective, doing something, or you know, you don't want to. If you want to, if you divulge too much about yourself, that might uh, might not be received well. So, but there's nothing legal you know, from a legal perspective would be an issue. All right. So there was a question that came in, and this would be from from one of our new and upcoming healthcare executives. If if I'm a, if I'm new, just getting out of school, newly graduate, um, with no real professional experience, um, what qualifications are folks looking for? Is there something different that I might be able to do with my profile or with these sites? Um, just from having hired a couple of new grads in the last couple months myself. Um, on, on a personal level, it's about attitude and aptitude. I mean, if you've got a uh, can display an ability to pick things up and to to grow quickly, and you're um, ambitious and you want to do that, and you've got an outgoing um, personality, uh, I think you can separate yourself. And by putting in, you know, a lot of students might not put the time in to develop a LinkedIn profile. They're still focused on Facebook. They're still connecting with friends. By just having a presence on LinkedIn and having your information out there easily accessible, um, don't be bashful about putting out some of your accomplishments that you've had in, in school. Um, you don't have any work experience to really highlight. So share the information you do have and not be bashful and um, have a presence on LinkedIn where others may not. Okay. Well, again, uh, that's, that's all the web questions. If there's any other questions, again, you can press star six and ask that now. Okay. All right, well, then I think that concludes our session. I want to thank Greg and uh, the Central yeah. Illinois chapter for having us on. Again, if you have any questions, need additional information. Um, my contact is Will Cheryl's contact information is on the slide, so I'm uh, more than happy to try to help you in any way that we can. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And I would like to thank you for your time, and thank you to experts Jamie, Cody, and Christine, in addition to our Cody William expert, Cheryl. If you have any questions or would like any additional information, please contact or Cheryl directly. Sorry about that. I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you to our B.E. Smith experts, Jamie, Cody, and Christine, in addition to our Hobie Williams expert, Cheryl. If you have any questions or would like any additional information, please contact Jamie and Cheryl direct. Um, after this webinar concludes, you will be directed to a short survey, which the Education Committee hopes you will take the time to fill out. Thank you very much and have a great day.